Let's go to the Nick. New York, I think we can get through this fairly easily. Um, Nick in New York, yeah, pronounce your him. Well, hey, yeah, what do you want to talk about, bud? Hi, uh, my question is, um, first time caller, by the way, thanks for taking my call. Um, thanks could for you the- give an example of a piece of evidence um, that you feel would demonstrate the existence of God? Uh, we have to be careful if you're asking like demonstrate, like prove or something. I mean, uh, I don't really know. I mean, a lot of people will come up with like, what if, you know, like the Hume kind of example, you arrange the stars in the sky or like it will whisper in your ear in everybody's you know language that can hear it. Um, I, I'm always like, well, you know, in those types of situations, I'd check the water supply to make sure there wasn't like a bunch of, you know, acid that was like dropped in it, or I'd get an fMRI and make sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the cards for those types of scenarios, like if I bet that that's going to happen tonight, the next night, the next night, I'm going to say that we don't live in a world where that's going to happen. Um, so I'm really confident that that won't occur. What I will say, what will convince me that the proposition is more likely to be true than not is those for the same reasons that I think that God does not exist. So I, I take more of like a stronger claim. Like my view is that there are no gods. Um, and my form of justification okay. on that is comparing theoretical virtues so like what i want to do is have the view that has the least amount of commitments ontological commitments axioms uh undefined terms ideological commitments right all of that the less commitment that i get out of there and the more that i can um pump out explanatory heavy lifting and explain the data that's the view i'm going to go with and so from my perspective something like um a non-naturalism uh, or I'm sorry, non-naturalism uh, um, or an atheistic non-naturalism is more likely than any type of theism. Uh, but I, I lean towards like uh, a view called naturalism is, is the view that I think is um, probably the one that wins that battle. So if if so, to answer your question directly, if somebody could show me that in fact theism was simpler and explains more data, or the data is explained equally, but it's a simpler view, meta metaphysical view then I think that I'd have reason to think that it's like more likely true. Um, I just don't think that that project's successful. I'm at probably like one minus epsilon in terms of confidence that God doesn't exist. Uh, when it comes to... Yeah, go ahead. When it, when it comes to the evidence that will get us where there, I actually thought about this and I, to be honest, I can't think of anything. Because let's say somebody comes and says, I don't, I don't know, I'm the prophet of God and splits the moon in half, okay? Or I'm literally God. Um, and I don't know, make moves the stars and makes spells name with it. How can I right. know that this is God and not just a very powerful entity who's saying that? Like, how could I tell? Yeah. Like, the, First of all, the first thing I, f- I think is that I'm hallucinating. How could I tell the difference between hallucination <laughs> Or a dream, or, or a miracle. Like, can you t- can you tell the difference between hallucination and a miracle? Because I don't know. Uh, that would be my first explanation. But if there was a way to know that, okay, no, this is not hallucination, then I would my sec- my second guess would be, well, why would somebody that has the power to move stars necessarily be this creator of the universe? How do I know? Why would somebody that, with the power to move stars uh, necessarily be a truth teller? You know, it's one thing to move stars. Yeah, I mean, I I, are... imagine if I died. Imagine if I died and I woke up and it's the afterlife and we're like going, being picked to go to heaven and hell. I still wouldn't know in that situation if there's a God. How do I know that this is not just an afterlife by a powerful entity that has like how? Do, and even even if that entity comes to me, I'm like, okay, let me bring you to the beginning of time. I show you, yeah. show you that I made the universe. I was still like, well, you still have the power. To make me see whatever I whatever you want. Like if yeah. you have the power to move stars, maybe you also have the power to show me things that never happened, including you creating the universe. So yeah. I would not know. There's no way to, to there's no way to show this to anybody. Yeah, it's kind of like if you you know the yeah, omnibenevolence I, 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 thing. Oh, sorry, go oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go. I'm interrupting you. I was I was just gonna all I was chiming in was just to say it's like oh, it's okay. someone could I, could I, say, I, Hey, I'm an all good I, god, I, and I, all I, they'd have to all they'd have to show you is they did really good things up until that point, then they can go off and do some horrible thing and you wouldn't know it. Right. So there's a lot of issues, but anyway, go ahead. Well, it seems, it's interesting that what you said there um, made me think of something that I, so you actually answered, I had a second part of the question 
which is if you could provide an example of something that would demonstrate um, the existence of God, the deeper question is, how do you then demonstrate that that example would be universally persuasive to everyone, including oh, yourself? That, I mean, it seems to be the case. That's a great question. That <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a great I, question. But I also want to just quickly um, uh, speak to something that was just said, which is, right, If even if God showed you, how do you know he's just not making you? But there's implicit in that statement, um, you seem certain about the fact that you can't be certain. And that, and I just, as a passing comment, I think that's kind of interesting, because it seems to be that you've landed on this um, notion that you that you can be certain about the fact that you can never be certain. And so I'm not entirely sure what it is. So part of the reason I'm calling in today is because I had a very long conversation with an atheist friend of mine. Uh, we went on for like 12 hours about the existence of God, and one of the things I had coming out of that, and he encouraged me to call in here and ask you guys and see your response, is I, I could be completely getting this wrong, so tell me if I am. But sure. in a way, it sounds like, in effect, that you're saying there is no evidence that could convince you, so I'm not entirely sure what it is you're asking uh, well, to do. But did maybe I get that not, wrong? Uh, right. Well, no, I'll let Armin speak okay. for himself, but like, there's, there's one thing that's really important here in the background. Um, it like if okay. the entity like this is like a problem I have with the God hypothesis in general um, for anything that you're trying to explain in the world and you like look at some object and you go, well, what explains why that exists? Um, what's in the background there is, well, there's an entity that desires that thing, um, has that ability to produce that thing and doesn't have any like reasons not to produce that thing. And if that's true, right, if like that's the hypothesis. I can construct evidence like this. This is a point um, that, that's like at least captivated me on, on this. I don't know how much it'll it will resonate with you, but like imagine sure. I um, I have like really good successive Mondays for like years, and I'm like, well, why am I having these really good Mondays? Like I have like I consistently just have these really good Mondays. Like they're blissful and just absolutely amazing. <laughs> well, there's a I'm entity all could be good. Well, I would like, so I could construct a hypothesis and be like, okay, well, what explains why I'm having good Mondays is there's an entity that desires me to have good Mondays, has the ability to give me good Mondays and doesn't have any reasons not to give me the Mondays. Uh, and so then another Monday passes and I'm like, whoa, okay, that's evidence for the hypothesis of good day fairies that bless me on Mondays, right? And I, I, my issue is like, I genuinely don't see much of a difference when people are invoking the God hypothesis uh, because it's like, I mean, I could explain anything anything that it, just there being like a rock on the ground or like a drum set like any any world you can conceive of is is compatible with the god hypothesis um and so it just doesn't seem like a very interesting hypothesis it sounds more like an ad hoc type of reasoning of like oh well, what explains this i can construct evidence pretty cheap so i'm i'm like skeptical on the evidence on what that is okay. uh, maybe there is evidence but is it like weakly constructed uh, given the hypothesis, right? Um, and so I'm not saying there isn't. I need to like have somebody kind of explain to me what the hypothesis is, and then for me to go through these like, kind of virtue comparisons. That's how I'm going to be convinced because I'm kind of with Armin. How am I going to know that this isn't some gap in my knowledge or scientific knowledge? Uh, maybe I can think it's likely to be a god. I don't know. One method I think, and this will answer what you're saying, how can you get everybody universally on board, is I'm just going to ask people, do you think that the view that is going to win out of all of our views, our best views is going to be the view that makes least amount of commitments and explains all the data, right? We like, don't, if I say one cat knocked over the marble and you say 10,000 cats knocked over the marble, like clearly that amount of commitments is unnecessary to explain the data. And so if someone can agree to that principle that we should have this trade-off between the simplicity of our theories and the explanatory breadth and depth of our theories, if we can equalize this trade-off really well, then we'll end up with the view that we ought um, we ought hold to, given we hold that principle. I think most people do, because if they don't, I'm just going to say, well, why don't you believe in two gods? Because that explains the data. And then Armin will say, well, three gods. And I'll say four gods, five gods, six gods. And we'll just complicate the view into you know, ad infinitum. And so I do think people hold to this principle. Okay. I don't uh, know if that, does Armin, that make I sense? I want to jump in out of order. I just. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just asking, does that make sense? I, I know I went on a tangent, but. Um, I, so I, I believe I tracked a little bit with what you were saying. Yes. Um, I got a little confused, uh, there, but, um, I don't think that's because you were confusing. I think it's just as my mind was working as I was listening to you. And, and so I uh, may need yeah. to iron that one out a little bit. Um, I think the, all I meant by universally persuasive earlier, and I don't, I don't know if this is a response to what you just said, is that it, it seems to me to be the case that um, there, there are no worldviews that I'm aware of that rest their truth claims, including atheism, including you know, evolution, something like that, would never rest its truth claim on the fact that it was universally persuasive because not everybody believes atheism, not everybody believes, you know, evolution. I mean, there are people who think the world is flat. Like, obviously, no one... I just, yeah, I just, I just meant like a universal principle that we can, we can agree upon. I'm not, not saying universally persuasive. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm just going to point out that I think what you were saying. Yeah. I'm just using like an abductive method on what's most likely because my kind of my, the view that I'm holding is, deductive arguments for God existing is just never going to convince the atheist, right? It's going to, one of the premises is going to assume something that they already don't accept. And likewise, me giving an argument why God doesn't exist to a theist, they're probably not going to be convinced by that argument. They're going to say, well, what's the argument for premise two in that argument? And then we'll get like inception of arguments, right? It doesn't seem like we'll ever battle that. All I'm saying is that it seems that like we can construct evidence we can underdetermine the hypotheses and be like, well, this is consistent with theism and this is consistent with naturalism. And I just want to say, look, uh, there might be a huge problem here that we won't ever solve this kind of what Armin said, like, you know, this thing's revealed to me. It's like, well, I mean, it's still consistently evidence for other views that can take a hold of that. So it seems like the only way we can settle metaphysical disputes uh, because we, like, I mean, we don't have a science for this and no agreed upon expert consensus in philosophy, since that doesn't exist, the only thing we can do is compare theoretical virtues. Yes, and, and actually, let me, as a Christian, let me just say that as, as I tracked with what you were just saying, I would actually agree that strictly, if I understood you correctly, strictly on, like, deism, going from, you know, there's no God to there's a God of some sort, um, yeah, there, there's definitely a limit to what we would understand about that God. And I think you are absolutely right in saying that it would, it would essentially it could equate to the idea of like, why not two gods? Why not three? Why not fairies? Something like that. Um, yeah. I mean, everybody seems to have sort of a, um, a tra- as Aristotle would say, a transcendent prime mover something that has austerity, that has self-existence. I think there's a case to be made for that thing. I don't know, because there's people who hold to an infinite... There's some people that hold to an infinite regression. I mean, I'll hold to a necessary foundation or something like that, but I do that for brevity. I do that because I want to show the theist that it's more favorable on naturalism. Like, my whole claim is that you can just start shaving all this extra stuff off and you're left with, like, naturalism at the end of it. I think... Yeah, I but think, I mean, I think you know, if I want to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think I think uh, what uh, Mike, Mike is the the simple way to understand what he's saying. If correct me if I'm wrong, is that the God argument doesn't do anything. Like doesn't it doesn't help with anything. It doesn't pro, uh, it doesn't yeah. provide any understanding of anything. Like w- we're no better off with it. It doesn't have any explanatory power. It doesn't exactly. have any prediction power. It's just there. And people are asking us, well, why shouldn't it? Well, like, we should be, why is it there? What is it doing? Right. It doesn't have any evidence. Right. It doesn't have any, it doesn't so, m- demystify anything. It does nothing. It's just sitting there. Like, I don't understand why. Yeah, it's we, an idle wheel. Exactly. There. Exactly, Armin. 100%. <laughs> well, <there's, laughs> this is exactly what I'm saying. And I'm just saying that these virtues, we just shave it off and then we're left with naturalism. That's that's all my, that's all my claim is. is that would, the simplest view turns you know, out to be some form of non or naturalism or non-naturalism. Two, um, two quick responses. Um, you guys are being very generous, by the way, with your time. Um, but I, uh, I would just say on the infinite regression part, I, I would disagree with that. Just because I actually think that argument can be dismissed fairly easily because a truly infinite regression, we would never begin to exist because there would be an infinite That's amount of time prior to when we showed up. 
And so we would never actually, it, the print wait, would actually never come to pass. That's not true. That's not true. If you look at, if you look at, if, okay, do you know why on a graph, like if you draw the Y is equal X graph, you understand that the point one and one, X is equal one and Y equal one exists, even though there's infinite before it and infinite after it. It does exist. Um, like you, 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 okay. I'm trying to visualize what you're saying. I'm, I'm sorry. I am kind of a visual learner. So if I could see what you're talking about, I'd have an easier time, but I'll, I'll go with it if you want to keep describing what you're saying. So, so if you draw, if, okay, so. Okay, so if you Woo, draw drawing. <laughs> a line and a graph like this, right? So this this line, right? So if I go like I don't know, x is equal uh, three and y is equal one, right? So this dot here okay. is it? exists. It does exist, even though there's infinite before it, even though there's infinite before it and infinite after. We got to this point. This point does exist. But, that, but you're assuming the thing so, is being argued. The thing that is being argued is whether or not there is infinite before and after. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see the issue. Like so, like this. This is so again. I don't hold to the view, but um, there is. Okay, I, so I, I often ask. A quick point. No, no, no. You're fine. Like I look. I get the concern. Like, and it's not intuitive. But like, I mean, how familiar are you with like Cantor's property, for example? Uh, did you say Cantor's property? Yeah. I'm I'm not very familiar with that. Yeah, so like there's that, a lot of a lot of weird zero. stuffs. <laughs> well, we we have a lot of weird properties like with infinity. We can like have the this uh, an infinite number of the odd numbers and the even numbers, right? Like in an infinite set. And there's like different sizes of infinities. And I'm not really like versed in all of this. So people who are, sure. uh, you know, hold hold the cringe um, because I, they'll speak way past kind of where I'm at. But there are people like uh, Alex Malpass, who's a philosopher in West Morston, who've written papers on this um, that kind of go over a lot of the confusions that are there. I, my concern is like, I don't, so... I don't hold to an infinite past for the same kind of thing I said earlier. It's for me, uh, infinitely more complicated of a theory in a sense to me. So I don't hold the view. I'm, I'm don't, I, I think that that's a, that's a scientific question. So I'm reserving my judgment really on that, but I'm happy to plant my flag that there's a beginning for the sake of a conversation with a theist. Um, I don't see any contradiction in an infinite series of events. So all I need to show that that view is not possible is just demonstrating some co like contradiction, right? The proposition and then the negation of that proposition in conjunction with one another, P and not P. When, if you can do that, if you can derive that, then yeah, it's impossible. But I've gone through this, these conversations for years and no one ever okay. delivers that. The last question's like, you know, well, will the sniper take a shot in this example, which is a very common Muslim one, but it's like, why are you, you're supposed to be the one showing why it's impossible. Right, not me like right. explaining Sorry, delivers, why I think it's possible. Delivers what specifically? A uh, contradiction. Oh, I, you're talking about the burden of proof. So, yeah, if someone thinks it's impossible, yeah. the burden of proof is yeah. for them to specify what modality of possibility. Is it nomologically impossible? Right, is it violate a law of nature? Right. Is it um, uh, logically impossible? Right. Yeah, I mean, and then from there, your burden is to, right. to, to make that derivation of a contradiction. Right. And also, Nick, our, our, our minds. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick. Um, our minds are not very good at fig understanding these things when it comes to infinity. I mean, think about this. We, through <laughs> observation, we realize that matter could turn into energy. Like our minds would never would see that as a contradiction. We figured out that right. apparently time and space are connected or the same thing even like that. That makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. We're from like, the Christian if you were just doing view, philosophy, how can God be? No, no. Oh, sorry. No, no. I'm talking about it from a common sense perspective. If we were just relying on philosophy and thinking about this, this would be a, these will, will all be contradictions. So, is I think it's just expecting too much. Like from if you're saying this is impossible, I think it takes a lot of. Um, ego to think that humans could think in terms of infinity given that we've seen how how much they fail we our minds cannot go between beyond newtonian physics like we understand that if you our minds the way that our minds are 
wired understands that if this is a ball is thrown on the wall, it's going to hit, hit us back. A bigger stone is probably heavier than a smaller stone, right? It doesn't, it cannot think in terms of infinity, in terms of, I don't know how time and matter uh, and how time and space are connected, how matter turns into energy. These are the things that we figured out through scientific methods, right? So given how much we fail, I think it's too much for you to ask us to know whether this is a contradiction or not. We, we've seen how much philosophy fails in these areas. I mean, it does good things in other areas, but in these areas, we cannot rely on rationalism to figure these things out. We have to rely on the scientific method. So if you are claiming that there's a contradiction here or if this is impossible, we need to figure out how you know that. Because if, you, if you're relying on our intuitions, our intuitions have failed us time and time again. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not entirely clear on what I, and by the way, everything you just said, I would, I think I, I didn't hear anything that I disagree with, um, just as a personal opinion, but, and I completely agree, um, that, you know, it's one thing I've heard Christians say, and I'm like, man, I, I don't, or deist, that's say, deist, I do think the burden of proof is on the person bringing the proposition. So when somebody says, you know, I believe that God exists. Um, it is not the atheist's job to then say, well, I take on the burden of proof of proving why God does not exist. The only time an atheist, I think, would have the burden of proof is when there's something that's been established and they are, try and they are effectively trying to demonstrate why the evidence for the proposition fails, which is, it sounds like what you guys um, do. Like, so anyway... Uh, yeah, I mean, but in the infinity um, case, if if you yeah. ask J. Mike, do you think in infinity is possible? I mean, I can answer it like, well, I don't see why not. And then you know, I get what you're saying. There's not really this like burden. But if I say, yeah, I think it's possible, and you say, okay, well, what's the reason? I say, well, because there's there hasn't been an identified contradiction. I don't really know what else I can give you other than uh, mm -hmm. all mathematicians that I know use infinities and have no problem with it. In fact, every mathematician that I've reached out to to discuss this. Has when I asked the question, do you think that there's a problem with an infinite series of past events? Unanimously, none of them have a problem. And and maybe you know someone could point out, well, it's biased because they accept you know working with these infinite sets, and they're of course they're going to say that. But I mean, they're pretty in depth with the concept. They've wrapped around their mind around it and gone over that kind of hump that Armin was speaking about and how we think very like new in this Newtonian kind of sense. Um, so I agree with you that 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 you know there's a, a burden in a sense, but I mean. I'm just going to give the reasons of why I think that proposition is true because sure. there's no identified contradiction. And if presumably if we're both in the, the dispute of tr like the pursuit of truth together and not like winning a basketball game amongst one another, you would just point out to me like, well, Hey, J Mike, there actually is a contradiction. Let here's the derivation. You know, what do you think about it? And I look over it and I go, shit, Nick, uh, this is a problem for me. I, I guess I got to kind of go back to the whiteboard and, and revise this view. And we make progress in the conversation, but I don't know that there's much someone in that situation can really do other than just say, uh, look, I'm not convinced that there's a contradiction. And I think there's more reason to suggest that there isn't one um, or any problem with it. But uh, yeah, well, well. one thing I wanted to point out real quick to you, though, is that if you have a problem, this is why I suggest Malpass and Morriston on this, is that um, there's no asymmetry between a past series of events and a future endless series of events. And so... Um, at least that's the claim in the in the paper and the claim that I tend to agree with. And if if there if an act, if an actual infinite is impossible, and you know we're talking about an infinite series of past events, then well, when Jesus offers you eternal life or you live in heaven, I mean, is that not an actual in, infinity? I mean, to me, it seems that you just have a, a direct symmetry between the two, and so we should have never made that move mm. in the first place. Yeah. But oh no! I, that's just my I thoughts. Agree. I mean, as a as a Christian, I do believe that there is something, <clears throat> pardon me, that exists that is infinite. I just my belief is that that is God, which is why, which is what explains both a past, quote unquote, past um, infinity and a future infinity, or what in a Christian parlance it would be eternity. Um, that that explains why where the concept. Sure, but then you would understand why an atheist who says God doesn't exist, and they ask you why, you say because I right. uh, I believe that there's a past infinite series of events, so there couldn't have been a uh, a mind that exists alone that creates the external world, right? Because that would be a point at which there's no prior moment. 
or prior. Well, oh, be careful oh, with time. No, no, be careful no, with time mean, since if you you know you might think God's timeless. Also, so an ontological priority, right? There's not something ontologically prior to him. Also, the infinite also regress thing now. Of the infinite. Oh, go ahead. No, the infinite regress is just being passed to the God now because we said like we can't. A lot of theists they say, "Oh, we we need God because we can't have infinite regress." I'm like, "Okay, how do you solve infinite regress with God? Like, well, how how long God existed? Like, oh, well, infinity. I'm like, okay, now you just pass on the infinite regress problem from creation to God. And like, okay, why can't God doesn't have that problem? Like, oh, because God is special. Like, well, how do you know the universe is not special? Maybe the special, maybe the thing that you thought it was special about God that can have infinite regress is now true about the universe. You know, it doesn't." Right. And yeah, there's what exactly yeah, it's special pleading. Yeah, no, you put your finger on it. It's it, the only, in, in my understanding, the only argument that's happening is the nature of the thing that's infinite, not whether or not an infinite exists. It seems to be the case that everybody is landing on the same page. It's just a question of what is the nature of that infinity. Um, is it a personal, supernatural, transcendent mind? Um, spirit, or is it? I don't. I don't have a word for it. Inert. Um, um, I'm trying to find a, a better word than like lifeless, but effectively something without a conscious. Anyway. I mean, why would you add conscious? Sure. It doesn't make any sense. It just. I, I mean, adding conscious to all of this is just needlessly making everything more complicated. Do you understand how complicated and out of? It's just out of nowhere. You know, we're, we're trying to come up with the most that's, simple explanation for why things. Yeah. What's that? What's I, I would say that's an assertion. If 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 you, um, I'm, let me try to think about how to articulate this concisely. And basically, can you demonstrate to me the idea that conscience is necess consciousness is necessarily a complex thing? In other words, I can think of God as actually being simple. It, it well, doesn't has, necessarily have to be. Consci consciousness doesn't necessarily equate to complexity. Um, so if I were to well, I mean, you, you demonstrate could, why it needs to be complex. Because because if you need to explain to me how, how did you brought up consciousness into the whole this whole formula, then you're like then you will be the way to explain that is a lot more difficult than any than many other oh, theories. Sure. Oh, oh, like, oh. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I would say the fact that space-time, our, our understanding of space-time um, as having itself a definitive point in the past, i.e. the Big Bang, some people call it, um, that the, the nature of the thing that set that in motion um, that, that we know of, that we're aware of, there are basically two things that transcend the material um, that we're aware of that can set things in motion. Or, I'm sorry, that transcend. One is numbers. One is the idea of abstract numbers. The other is consciousness, is a mind. And so the fact that our um, space-time continuum came into existence, i.e., it translated from... Wait, where did, he, where did he getting this from? Are things that could set other things in motion okay. is either numbers or, or, like, what does that even mean? I, I miss... No, yeah, no, you're right. I miss, I misspoke there. I tried to correct myself. Numbers can't send something in motion. What I, what I meant is um, the two things that we're aware of that transcend the material would be like numbers as an abstract. Concept. Why does it have to? Why does it have to transcend the material? Okay. What does yeah, that just, even mean? It just begs the question against the nominalist, right? Not nominalist precisely deny that numbers are abstract, oh. right? So like. To say that it would just like the nominalist, you know, same anomalous. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna be like, perk my ears. Like, what, what the fuck? Like, I, well, you're just begging the question against my view, right? Like, numbers are conceptual. Okay. What are you talking about, right? Like, they're not abstract floating things or whatever. Like, if that was the view that I held, um, you would just be begging the question against the view, right? You'd have to give an argument to right. show to that person. This is why I was kind of saying we have this inception of arguments with all this metaphysical baggage, right? Like that as an example, you brought in numbers and consciousness and question against an identity theorist, right? Who thinks that the brain just is mind, right? There, there really is no mind. It's just a shorthand word we use for like neural correlates or axons, neurons, however the brain works, right? I mean, ask Shannon Q because I'm, I'm sure she, she knows a lot better than me. Um, 
but right, like all of that's going to be assumed oh, in your, in, all that stuff's going to be assumed yeah. under your metaphysical theory that you already have. That's why I'm saying yeah. these theories come first and then you start arguing for them or start like usually providing evidence in these cases in this philosophical sense. And no one like our men or myself, you know, for an identity theorist would accept anything like about consciousness that you have to offer or um, especially like we, we're just going to deny that you can have a disembodied mind, right? Like in order to have, a, you, you can have a mind if and only if there's a physical substrate. I think that's a, something that me and Armin, I don't speak for Armin, but I think we probably both hold to that view and you would just be kind of assuming the falsity of our view, right? Or w even well, when you I just say, say trans, right. even, with, even, even when you say trans, even when you just say transcend the material, you're exactly. already assuming things. You're you're assuming that, that there's such a thing. There's such a thing. Maybe like you don't. You have to show that there could existence could is it even possible beyond material. So you already have this worldview, and right. you're pre-assuming things, and you're building upon it. And and note. And I'm sorry to cut you're you, Nick. Right. I, 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 I just want to. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. I've cut you off like several times. I just. This is so important. This is why I want to stress this method of why I'm saying I think naturalism is more likely true or that God doesn't exist because notice the things that you have put onto the table to explain things, numbers being abstract, um, uh, mm -hmm. minds, not just being physical. There being a transcendent realm, a divine realm, gods, none of that plays any, like we don't need any of that to have any explanatory heavy lifting in our view. So like we're, we're looking at the, all of these idle wheels that are going like, this isn't necessary to explain the data. Maybe someone could show that it is. I'm not convinced that it is. But I have less ontological commitments, less axioms that I'm basing things off of, less predicates, right? You're no more or less committed to um, a primitive notion of electrons the same way that I am. We're both committed to these. It's not like you can just say God exists and then do the derivation to electrons or something like that, right? Okay. We're no more or less committed to these things in the natural world and the terms that we use to describe them. Uh, no more or less than each other, but you add more predicates, you add more axioms, you add more ontology. And then I'm just looking at like me and Armin are getting on the plane and we're looking back at you and it just looks like T TSA stopped you. It's like your bag's too full. Like you don't, you don't need all this for your trip, right? That's kind of why I'm saying we could be rationally justified to say God does not exist uh, given the that it's a more virtuous theory and the simpler theory. And I'm going to point that out that the reason why I point that out is when you brought all that stuff up, you're adding all of this stuff that I'm going, it's giving me more reason to think that my view is more virtuous than I thought before. You're, you are, you are right. Um, absolutely. And I'm glad you pointed it out. I did not earn it. I started making assertions that I had not taken the time to earn. And I, I, I could point one thing, um, out that, um, uh, Sorry, you just said so much. I'm trying to. Oh, that's my bad, Nick. And I, let me apologize to you. I, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, dude. I'm actually. I was so nervous calling in, and you guys are fantastic. It's like great to talk to you guys. But, um, no, you're awesome too. I, I enjoy this conversation a lot. You're very I, honest, Nick. I wanna. I wanna congratulate you on that. The level of you know honesty that you have when it comes about the things that you're not certain about. How willing you are to listen to us. How unsure you're skeptical you are about your positions and how i i mean there's not that many people um, either theist or atheist that are this open to accepting that maybe they made a mistake here so i just want to congratulate you on that yeah and apologies for, i think we've thanks cut so much i mean times. this is a love yeah. fest I, I might as well say i love the, <laughs> as well. yeah. Yeah, I love the background i think it's <laughs> I think it's great. I would. The only thing I'll throw in, just as a passing comment, is when I talked about the transcendent there, why would something have to be transcendent beyond the material? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, let me put this out there as a thought and see what you guys think about it. That um, if nature, if time, if the time-space continuum had a beginning at the Big Bang, mm -hmm. not just space but time, um, and the Big Bang is the effect. I know this is an old argument you guys probably heard. It's just the relationship between cause and effect, that whatever translated it from a state of what it was into a state of what it is, um, the question is, if you, in order to point to a material cause for that, you're actually pointing to something that exists within the system because it's part of what the system itself is composed of, which is material. Uh, I don't know, because this, so this like assumes the falsity it, of my view. Well, that's the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no, I was just going to say it, it 
seems to be the case, and again, it's just a passing comment, that whatever caused the material to come into exist would itself mm -hmm. have to not share the fabric of the nature of what it's causing. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I, I don't agree with that. Immaterial. Because like, so, yeah, okay. so I don't, okay. I don't agree with that. And here's, here's kind of a view that I'll lay out for you. Like, m my view that I'm most sympathetic towards is that there's, um, I mean, you can find someone like Graham Oppie who expresses this view, um, that there's an initial state of the universe. Um, and that initial okay. state is necessary. Like, it couldn't have not existed. Right? It's, the, it's the origin point of natural reality. Uh, similarly, like a theist might think, you know, God is the origin point of, of reality or, you know, the timeless, wh whatever you want to view that, right? He's the first ontological kind of item. Um, in my view, I don't really see why I would have to appeal to anything like immaterial if the initial state that's necess metaphysically necessary that has to exist, right? Why does the initial state exist? Because it's necessary. It's going to be a natural cause that or a natural thing that has dispositions to to like um, unfold, maybe it's a chancy event, an indeterminate event and that unfolds. Maybe it's strict determinism uh, or like, you know, just necessitarianism, everything is necessary. There's only one way the world could be. Right. But I don't see any, any issue on why, like what the contradiction, I guess this, is, this, would, this would be the thing I'd ask so someone could get me out of the view. I'd say, well, what's the contradiction in this, this postulate of an initial state that's natural um, that that exists of necessity. Um, I don't see a contradiction at all. If, if someone could point that out, that'd be great. But, you know, it's also a reason why when someone brings the Kalam to me, I'm not going to accept the first premise because it's like everything that begins right. to exist has a cause. In my view, all non-initial items that begin to exist have a cause. But the initial item, right, the first thing, the beginning, the first moment of time, that's the beginning of natural reality, but it has no cause, right? It's just the exist of metaphysical necessity. The same way that a theist is like, well, God exists, metaphys you know, uh, of necessity, but there's no cause of God. And I get weirded out that theists right. aren't wouldn't be sympathetic to my view because I'm I'm more I'm kind of making the same chess moves, right? We're both explaining why is there something rather than nothing with some metaphysically necessary thing. Mine just doesn't have consciousness or intentional states or desires or cares about what we do and we're naked or whatever, right? I I also think yeah, that you your maybe you're as I think I also think that you might be asking too much of our brain when it comes to thinking about the initial state of the universe and stuff like that, right? Because given how our minds were not hardwired for thinking about those conditions, those where you know the laws of physics are beyond the Newtonian beyond the thing that our Newtonian mind could make sense of, I would expect like people are trying to make sense of those conditions, but I would expect the answer to be something that actually doesn't make sense. Just like other new things that we have discovered through modern physics. So if it's actually something that, oh, like, oh yeah, I, I get that. I get that. I get how that the initial, if somebody explained, like if, if, if initially the answer comes to be something that I could understand, I would be suspicious. I would like, I should, it should, I would be more, it would, I would um, bet that it would be something that would blow my mind. I was like, yeah, this doesn't make absolutely no sense. So the fact that a lot of theists are trying to uh, figure out, the in talk about the initial state of the universe and using rationality to figure out what would make sense, I think it's this. it comes with this assumption that it has to make sense to the human mind, where the more likely scenario would be, for me at least, the answer would be something that will actually not make rational sense to us because our brains were not designed to understand. I mean, and I, and I say designed in a metaphorical sense, designed to understand those types of those conditions. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. Nick, after you, after you respond, you Nick, uh, we'll have to, I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to put this of here. Course. Go ahead and respond. Uh, after this, we'll have to move on. I wanted to give you a lot of time. We've had like 30 minutes on the call, but go ahead and please respond. Uh, and that way wow. we can move to one last caller. I've really enjoyed the conversation though, but yeah, please, please continue. Me too. And I'm looking forward to calling back sometime and maybe discussing further, but I just to button it. I think the two points that you both just made uh, were absolutely spot on. I think uh, I've the nature of the disagreement is just over the nature of what the infinite is. If I'm understanding what you said, 
And I would say either whether that thing is a transcendent spiritual God or not, absolutely, Armin, it is, it is, there are limitations to, I, I mean, I, I struggle to do Rosetta Stone Spanish. Like there's going to be limitations to what I can understand about the nature of reality at its, at its first conception or, or its first point. So, so yeah, I, great conversation. Thank you guys so much for your time. Wish yeah, I'll, sure. I'll say God bless because I'm a Christian and take care. Sure. Well, and, and, and Nick, I'll, I'll leave you with this one last thing. Uh, just kind of on the, the comparison thing. Notice in the view that you agree with that, there, like God creates an initial state more, more than likely the, you know, what the universe ends up being. And I think that there's an initial state of necessity. Um, one thing I'd ask yourself on this and why I don't see you. Well, here's, here's the thing I want to ask you. Yeah. I mean, I understand that a satiety is, is important to you. Um, but if the initial state under your view is contingent, Right, meaning that God didn't necessarily have to create that state. He could have created any other state, a state that just produces marbles or a state that just produces chairs or whatever. If that's contingent or he could have just not created, then we can ask this question, why did God create that initial state rather than another or none at all? And for that, we typically won't get an answer unless someone just bakes in more auxiliary hypotheses like, well, God's loving. Okay, well, yeah, but he could have loved marbles, right? He could have loved just J Mike's mm -hmm. in the world, right? So just to pick on like one of these desires as if it fits that data would be extremely strange. And if we don't get an answer, what it ends up turning out is that under my view, it's fully explained why we have the initial state the way it is and the constants we do. Whereas under the theist view, we have like a brute, what's called a brute contingency. It's contingent, but we get no further explanation. And so you know, so much for like a principle of sufficient reason or so much for any of these things where like um, we're supposed to be, God's supposed to be doing this explanatory heavy lifting. It just turns out that he's not. And so we should just posit something that's um, simpler that explains all the data and that's to shave off the God hypothesis. But sorry, I'll let you uh, get going. I just wanted to bring that full circle if you want to watch that call back on why this method is kind of is important to me. Um, because I think it's very, it's like glaringly obvious in these conversations how much is packed in to the view uh, that I don't have any need for. But again, Nick, uh, we appreciate you. Great, great call. Hopefully I, hopefully I run into you online somewhere in some debate thing or something and community and we can continue the conversation. That'd be great.